so my memories of chasing frogs in Basra are equivalent to my memories of feeding the ducks at the Crestwood train station in, uh, where my, uh, my grandparents lived um, near Yonkers. It's Westchester County, whatever. I'm not, I'm, I was born in New York, but that's the end of my New Yorkerness. Um, so uh, this is from back in the day. Um, my father passed away in September 2012. Um, and one of the, uh, may he rest in peace, but one of the hardest things for me um, as for anybody who is a parent, uh, but just trying to figure out what's happening um, in Iraq without my go-to person. Um, so hopefully I've done a good job of researching. If we have a thunderstorm later, then I think that would be my dad trying to say, we need to do some more research, but we'll see how tonight goes. Um, so this was then. And uh, this is more currently, my cousins and I, my first cousins and I are now the oldest generation and uh, I maintain my connection with them. These little ones are not such little ones anymore, uh, but uh, these are my bosses, it's for them that I still do what I do. And uh, again, I thank you for uh, your compassionate hearts, which I know brought you here tonight. So for them, we're trying to make a better world. Um, now. In this region, and particularly this area of Western Asia, and in other parts of the world, Latin America, um, Southeast Asia, you pick an area, there's pretty much what's happening within a particular country or area, um, if you haven't been allowed to become a country. Um, and then there's the influence of regional powers. And then on top of that is the influence of superpowers. So it's very difficult when you're talking about countries like um, like Iraq and Syria, it's difficult to see exactly who is responsible for what because all these influences are bearing down on what's happening within that country. So what I'm, I'm going to do my best to focus on what's happened with Iraqis. Um, there is, of course, overlap with regional powers, but my message is let's just make it a little bit more simpler and let's pull the superpowers out. That's maybe tilting at windmills, but I don't care. That's uh, that's bottom line. What we need to do. So these days, ever since June 10th, when we've heard that the news has been, well, ISIS has taken over northern and western Iraq, I've heard the question come up: Should the U.S. go back into Iraq? And this is usually my initial reaction. <laughs> I've worked really, really hard to answer that question. Um, now this is actually, I don't really have any right to complain in Albany, New York, but we had a rough winter. I'm even as far south as Delaware, so this was my response to winter. But it's also my response to sending any sort of arms funding or forces back into Iraq. Um, so my answer is still absolutely not. Um, the suffering in Iraq today is a direct result of the U.S.-led destruction of Iraqi society and the U.S. installation of a sectarian government. We brought sectarianism into Iraq, and that is what is tearing it apart today. Today in Iraq, there are countless militias, uh, many of them acting as death squads, operating in Iraq. These are predominantly Shia death squads through the government, um, and these have been brought in and orchestrated by the U.S. administration. That's a cause. The response has been an emergence of extremist groups on the other side. So this is, we have shaped the mess that is today, so I will argue that we don't have a role in fixing anything. So U.S. intervention is actually U.S. interference, and we don't need to interfere in anybody's business ever anymore. So U.S. interference in Iraq has actually been going on since at least 1955 with the signing of what was called the Baghdad Pact, which was actually a Western-led pact that was to oppose the, the power and influence of the Soviet Union. Um, and because the puppet government in Iraq at the time uh, signed that pact um, and the people were getting sick of British occupation, a few years later, in 1958, the British ended up getting kicked out. But uh, So it goes back as far as then. I'm not going to go. Those are all the details I'm going to give you from the 1950s. Um, but even if we look just in the last few decades for what the United States has done 
and the results of our policy in Iraq specifically, it shows that we have only made things worse, not made anything better. So you can look at the Iran-Iraq war, just touching on this briefly, um, Gulf War and 13 years of sanctions, shock and awe, and then the occupation, which involves so-called counterinsurgency operations. So just very briefly with the Iran-Iraq war, it was launched by Saddam Hussein in, uh, in 1980 with the backing of the United States and Saudi Arabia. Um, at this time, it was, in 1979, the theocracy had come to power in Iran, and the U.S. was looking for a balancing power to that theocracy. So with encouragement, Saddam Hussein launched the war, and then by arming both sides, uh, we helped it continue for eight long years costing uh, about a million casualties in, on, on both, side, both sides together. Um, and you may remember this happy picture, uh, <laughs> December 20th, 1983. Uh, at this point, this is now three years into the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, we are arming Iraq with conventional weapons as well as biological agents. Uh, we are using, showing them satellite imagery uh, that we've obtained from Iran, and at the same time, Pretty soon it starts going under the table. Uh, we're doing the same for Iran, showing uh, the positions of the Iraqi army through satellite imagery. That would come to light as the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, but as you can see, there's, and, and Saddam Hussein's brutality was very well known. It's actually one of the reasons, now that I've, I'm working on a book and I've done more research on it, it's actually one of the reasons we liked him so much, is because of his brutal nature. Um, and uh, this is private, then private citizen Donald Rumsfeld, who came as a re representative of the Reagan administration, affirming our strong ties with our ally in the region. So the Iran-Iraq war went on for those eight years. After that war, uh, the Ba'athist regime set forth a $40 billion reconstruction plan for Iraq. Um, but then, in events that happened between 1988, when the Iran-Iraq War ended, and August 2nd, 1990, uh, there were major frictions between Saddam Hussein and the Gulf states, in particular uh, Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. And on August 2nd, 1990, the Iraqi army moved into Kuwait and occupied Kuwait. Four days later, uh, the strictest the most strict in history, some argue, um, of sanctions, economic sanctions, were imposed on Iraq for their naked aggression. Um, I lost count of what day, we're at the 15th or 16th day of the Israeli assault on Gaza, and we have no sanctions being imposed. Um, but these sanctions were imposed in order to encourage Iraq to get out of Kuwait. Iraq came out of Kuwait. Uh, at the end of the Gulf War. Um, they had officially withdrawn when a ceasefire was called in February, uh, but the sanctions remained in place, and they were punitive to break the people, and they were maintained basically until the officially March 19, 2003, when we invaded again. Um, on January 17th, uh, the US-UK-led air assault began. This was 42 days straight of bombing. Um, and uh, we targeted civilian infrastructure, which was in direct um, uh, contradiction of international humanitarian law. Beyond that, you had a first world uh, uh, modernized healthcare system that relied on the technology of the first world, basically electricity. Um, and by taking away electricity, we devastated the healthcare system. Um, if you want, I can send you, I can email you everything. So oh, you're welcome to take pictures or I can email to you so it's easier. Okay. You're welcome We're to see me afterwards. Video again. All right. Okay. Um, on top of that was our use of depleted uranium, which at that time contaminated Iraq with over 300 tons of aerosolized radioactive dust. There were many cancers and birth defects that followed. And then, as I mentioned, the 13 years of economic sanctions, ultimately estimating that between 1.2 and 1.8 million Iraqis died during those 13 years. Um, at least half a million of those were children who died from uh, easily treatable diseases like diarrheal disease and upper respiratory infections. 
so that was our that was our treatment of Iraq uh, from 1991 to 2003, and then, as I'm sure you all remember, shock and awe came. Um, shock and awe wasn't just a clever title; it was actually a position paper written by Harlan K. Allman and James Wade. Uh, and this was, the, the whole title was Shock and Awe, Achieving Rapid Dominance. And the, basically the, the plan, the agenda was written in the introduction. I think you, I pulled this up online, you can still pull it up. And uh, Shock and Fear, this is actually when I visited my cousins. I don't speak Arabic. Um, my parents spoke English at home when I was little. So still, to this day, most of the Arabic I know cannot be repeated. My dad only used Arabic when he was angry. Um, so my, parents, my cousins have to speak to me in English. And the way they translated it was shock and fear, which I think is a more accurate description. Um, and what the authors of this paper, Achieving Rapid Dominance, said was that the goal of rapid dominance will be to destroy or so confound the will to resist that an adversary will have no alternative except to accept our strategic aims and military objectives. If you look up the Defense Department's definition of terrorism, this is what it says. Using violent force to coerce a target group to submit to a political, uh, a specific agenda. So that's really what we did. And this is what we saw on March 19th. Now it's pretty sadistic for people to pack a picnic and go and watch the bombing of Gaza from a hilltop. This isn't much better. M much of America watched this on CNN because CNN knew they had an audience. So we're not that far behind. And this is, I can guarantee you in this image, though we see the, the bluster and the explosions, there, what we can't see are the injuries and the people dying. So 2003, the invasion, the, the overall invasion took about three weeks. Of course, Baghdad fell on April 9th. And what came afterwards was a military occupation, which then involved uh, into being called counterinsurgency operations. So what I'm going to do is now discuss US interference in Iraq from that point, 2003, to today. It's not all inclusive, of course. I'm going to give you highlights that I think shape, uh, do a good job of shaping the picture of what we're seeing today. But again, uh, when we get to the question and answer, you know, anything is game. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you um, the information that I have. So if we look at 2003, we invaded. Um, the government was removed, which is illegal. Um, the infrastructure was absolutely destroyed. And what took course from 2003 onward was the destruction of the whole civil society framework, just how the whole country operated. And so this tactic, which is an age-old tactic of empires to divide and conquer, was from the, it began from the very start, before most of us knew what was happening. And so this is actually a quote from an article written by a man from Baghdad, Leif al Saud, who uh, is in the States and he's a professor of Islamic world studies. And again, he's uh, originally an Iraqi. And he describes what happened and what the Americans did. With the infrastructures of Iraq absent, what once held up a sense of civic society is now being replaced with a sectarian nature. The average Iraqi is no sectarian. They have commonly been a secular, uh, a secular region, a secular people. What we have, rather, is the importation of sectarianism along with expatriates, many of whom had not been in the country for 30 years. Politicians such as Abdulaziz al-Hakim, Ibrahim al-Jafri, I'm going to come back to that guy, or even the secularist Ahmed Chalabi had little to do with Iraq when they came in with the Americans. Without possession of any practical representative power, they all took recourse in the realm of abstract sectarianism. So that's the general observation. Let me go into the specifics a little bit. Um, as, as you know, the Coalition Provisional Authority under L. Paul Bremer, that was the governmental structure that was begun after the invasion and uh, the fall of Baghdad. And uh, many people refer to, as, as do I, refer to it as Bremer is the viceroy for the viceroyalty that Iraq became. Um, it's a, a possession of the mother country here. 
Um, what Bremer did was uh, they nominated an Iraqi governing council, um, which was hand-selected by American administrators. It was 25 Iraqis on the council, and they were chosen according to sectarian and ethnic divisions. Um, again, 25 members. One of them was Ibrahim al Jafari, and I just want to mention him again because I'm going to come back to him. <coughs> um, and what was also in introduced in 2003 was something called Facilities Protection Service. Now this is a very innocuous name, mm -hmm. sounds good. Protecting facilities sounds good, but here's what it was all about. It was established by CPA Order 27 on April 10th, 2003. The Coalition Provisional Authority was already up to 27 orders by the day after Baghdad fell. <laughs> What it said, what this order said, was that each ministry of the government can establish a militia. So it would be like in the US, in DC, the Department of Agriculture had a militia to protect it. The Department of Health and Human Services had a, had a militia to protect it. Housing and Urban Development, Department of Energy, <laughs> all these different departments could have a militia um, that would protect them. And, the words from the order say uh, that these militias may consist of employees of private security firms who perform services for the ministries or governance through contracts licensed and authorized by the Ministry of the Interior. This was the introduction of government militias which have wreaked havoc on the minority population, the Sunni population predominantly through today in Iraq. So moving on to 2004, after that first year of the Coalition Provisional Authority, the so-called handover of power was made to Iyad Alawi, another member of the hand-picked uh, Iraqi Governing Council and former CIA operative. Um, so also during this year, this is when rebellion in Iraq against the occupation hit a high point. You had uprisings in the uh, predominantly Shia city of Nejef, in the south of Baghdad, and uprisings in the predominantly Sunni city of Fallujah. Now, the whole Sunni-Shia dialogue was not happening at that point in time. Again, Iraqis are not a sectarian people. Um, this was more an issue, and the people of Fallujah, though they were Sunni, um, they hated Saddam Hussein as much as the next town, uh, because everybody experienced persecution under the regime. And that was the thing about the regime. He really did not discriminate. If you were for the regime, who cares what ethnicity or religious sect you belong to? If you were against the regime, God help you, who cares what ethnicity or religious sect you belong to? So if you remember the deck of cards, uh, the, the 55 people we wanted to capture, 35 of the 55, their religion was Shia. So uh, we can talk more uh, about Sunni versus Shia at that time. But anyway, these uprisings were taking place um, from north and west in the country. And this is also the response were uh, the severe uh, U.S.-American military sieges of Fallujah. The first one in April with an estimated 600 to 800 civilian deaths. And the second one in November with an estimated between 6,000 and 8,000 civilian deaths which means that in the city of Fallujah alone, in November 2004 alone, there were more civilian deaths than American military deaths for the entire occupation, which comes out to be, I think, uh, it's around 4,500. At this point, the first Lancet study came out that estimated that there were 100,000 Iraqis who had died as a result of the invasion and occupation since March 2003. So Iraq is rebelling against a brutal occupation, but nevertheless, they hold the first democratic elections in the new Iraq in January of 2005. So I'm going to tell you my top 10 reasons why those Iraqi elections were illegitimate. And everything that happened at that time, the whole structure was imposed by the United States and has been continued from today. So number 10, the High Commission of Ele on Elections, a uh, commission that was established by Bremer, was appointed by Bremer 
um, and they rejected uh, parties that, uh, that the U.S. did not like, anything anti-occupation, <laughs> any party that stood for that was not allowed to run. Um, and they also, the people, the most pressing issue for the Iraqi people was a timetable for withdrawal. And they said, you can't talk about a timetable for withdrawal, that's just not an option. Number nine, the parties that were allowed to have candidates running were shaped by U.S. funded organizations like NDI, the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, and IRI, the International Republican Institute. Both of them have been affiliated with organizations with CIA ties. So that tends to delegitimize the parties who are involved. Number eight, more than 7,000 candidates were up for election for a 275-seat assembly because of security concerns. Most of them ran anonymous. <laughs> Number seven, each Iraqi could cast a single vote for a slate of candidates. There were varying numbers per slate. Again, most people were listed anonymous. And those who vote, those individuals who were listed, whom you voted for, those might not be the ones who eventually took office. Number six, there were more than 9,000 polling stations in Iraq. And again, because of security issues, most were not identified until the final hours before the election to, uh, to deter violence. Number five, more than 700 election workers in Mosul resigned days before the election because of threats, threats against their lives. Number four, there was a massive Sunni-led bo boycott of the uh, election. You're talking about 35% of Iraq's population, more than a third of the people. And this was especially because of that November 2004 siege of Fallujah which had been endorsed by, uh, by Yad Alawi, whom the handover of power had gone to. Um, so uh, after that, the Sunni leadership said, we're out. Um, the Iraq Islamic Party, which was a Sunni party, withdrew from the Alawi government, again, uh, created by the US. And the Association of Muslim Scholars, which represented uh, an estimated 3,000 mosques in Iraq, and we're going to come back to them in a few minutes, um, they, they issued the boycott. They said we're not participating. So 35% uh, approximately of the population refused to uh, legitimize the elections. Number three, the prominent candidates had a history of working for the occupiers, namely Iyad, Iyad Alawi, who was a CIA operative, Ibrahim al Jafari, there's his name again and Jaleel Talabani, who is still serving as the president of Iraq. You know, the names we're familiar with in the West tend to keep getting reelected. If you look at Hamid Karzai in Afghanistan, it just doesn't go away. <laughs> Top number two, there was no security in the country when they were handling elections. Um, they were actually very pleased that only 50 people were killed on the day of the election. I mean, we, we have a, a bit higher standards for democracy we really don't have democracy here, but nevertheless, um, lack of security uh, delegitimized the election. And the number one reason why Iraq's elections were illegitimate in 2005 and since then is it's not who votes that counts, it's who counts the votes, a statement by Joseph Stalin. This was an election conducted under American occupation, orchestrated by American occupation. So that was the election of 2005 that we orchestrated for Iraq. And guess who got named prime minister? Ibrahim al Jafari. Al Jafari is a member of the conservative Dawa party. Dawa is uh, loosely translated from my father as a uh, party of the call to God. Um, it's a conservative Shia party. Um, and when he became prime minister, he named uh, Bayan, a man named Bayan Jabbar as Minister of the Interior. Again, remember, the Facilities Protection Service, those government militias, were being organized through the Interior Ministry. Bayan Jabbar was a member of the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, which you may remember the acronym SIRI. Um, this is a conservative Shia, uh, Shia organization. And he's a former commander of the Badr Brigades. The Badr Brigades and, uh, and Skiri are based in Iran. So when you hear the opposition to Iranian influence in Iraq today, this is the basis of it. Under his watch, Shia death squads began operating in Iraq. 
Uh, these are the Iranian-based militias. Uh, these are a lot of religious uh, militias that when the borders, when we fail to secure the borders, religious militias from Iran crossed over um, along with the religious, along with the parties who wanted access to the two major holy cities for Shia Islam, uh, Nejaf and Karbala. So their militias came with them and they became integrated into the Iraqi army and uh, these uh, interior ministry militias. Again, these government militias, the Facilities Protection Service, and they became incorporated into the Iraqi police. But it wasn't just Bayan Jabr, it wasn't just Prime Minister Ibrahim al Jafari. This was the United States bringing the Salvador option to Iraq. So I want to come back to my take home point that the suffering in Iraq today is a direct result of the US led destruction of Iraqi society and the U.S. installation of a sectarian government. The government of Saddam Hussein was secular. Countless militias and death squads are operating in Iraq, and this is what we introduced to Vietnam uh, when we were doing counterinsurgency operations at that time. This was called Operation Phoenix. And this is what we did in El Salvador. Um, and the Iraqis, saw the sectarian violence that emerged in Iraq and really blew up from 2006 to 2008. They perceived it as an effort to split up the country. So this is from um, the RAND Corporation. The RAND is, uh, this is actually analysis from um, uh, a more mil militant group um, in the US, um, sort of political analysis from, uh, from maybe more towards the government's point of view. Um, is that Vietnam and Iraq thus form two legs of a historically fraught counterinsurgency triangle, with America's experiences in El Salvador in the 1980s providing the connecting leg. We brought death squads to Vietnam, we brought death squads to El Salvador and much of uh, Central America, and then we brought death squads to Iraq. In El Salvador, <coughs> What the U.S. government did was fund, arm, and train paramilitary forces. And what these forces did was that they assassinated the rebel leaders and their supporters. During this time of targeting rebel leaders and supporters, tens of thousands of innocent civilians were killed and just disappeared, including members of the Catholic Church, including Archbishop Oscar Romero, and including four American nuns who were kidnapped beaten, raped, and killed by one of these paramilitary death squads. In total, about 75,000 Salvadorans were killed during these years of counter U.S. counterinsurgery in El Salvador. In total, over 300,000 in Central America during the 1980s with these U.S.-directed policies. So we brought the same paradigm to Iraq. And the death squads were the Iraqi police special commando units. And these were Iraqis trained by U.S. special forces. Two of the most more famous ones were the Wolf Brigade and the Scorpion Team. These were hugely feared in Iraq. Again, the death squads operating as facilities protection service. At this point, they've been infiltrated by militias and they're acting as death squads. They had no oversight, no accountability. So from El Salvador to Iraq, we didn't just move the same system. We didn't just use the same paradigm to get the same result. The guys who did it in El Salvador were still alive. And they got new jobs in Iraq from 2003 to 2005. People like John Negroponte, Stephen Castillo, and U.S. Army Colonel James Steele. There's a documentary on James Steele that the, I, I think it's the BBC who has done it, 